Hi, and welcome to this re-recording of the opening to NCSC's second webinar for science education activists. We're talking here about how to, to lobby to defend and improve science education in state legislatures and in other public bodies. Unfortunately, the original audio for this and video for this um, webinar was got messed up. So I'm re-recording this. We did get from, from the middle of Vic Hutchinson's presentation on recorded, but Dina Scher's presentation unfortunately was lost. Dina is at the American Civil Liberties Union and before that was the state lobbyist for the uh, Americans United for Separation of Church and State. She, we do have Q&A with her in the other, other video. Uh, as well as with Vic Hutchison, who's the co-founder and past president of Oklahomans for Excellence in Science Education. He's also an emeritus professor at University of Oklahoma. So today we're going to talk about what to do when there is science denial in your legislature, in other public bodies. And this is not by any means a rare problem. There have been, in, in the last just few years, there have been uh, anti-science bills of various sorts, uh, education bills filed in uh, dozens of states, 20 some odd states uh, across the country, all over the place. No, no place is immune by any means. And a lot of these are from a family of what we call academic freedom bills. These, this is uh, based on model legislation published by the Discovery Institute, the home of intelligent design creationism. And it's the, the latest evolution of creationist strategy. In addition to these, we're still seeing laws calling for equal time for evolution and creationism in classrooms, or laws that would ban the teaching of evolution. Um, but the vast majority are from this, this family, uh, which under the guise of academic freedom, single evolution out for special treatment, uh, as well as climate change often, and open the door to creationist lessons without requiring anyone to do anything. So it's a tricky strategy harder to challenge in court, but no less pernicious. And I want to talk specifically as a case study about what happened in Tennessee when they actually passed one of these bills and how that, that happened. Another bill very similar uh, is it became law in Louisiana. All of the other 50 some odd versions of the bill that have been filed um, have not become law, which is a good sign, but the fact that two of them have become law is, is certainly troublesome and we don't want there to be a third. So the Tennessee bill, typically of, of how these things are, are written, claims that evolution and climate change are controversial. It singles them out for special scrutiny in the science classroom. It singles out the science classroom as opposed to all the others uh, and encourages teachers to, to promote critical thinking, critical analysis of these controversial topics. And the specific provision here is that teachers and students can't be punished for encouraging critical thinking, which hopefully they I mean, as far as anyone can tell, they weren't punished for that before. No one ever demonstrated that there was really a need for this. Teachers are already encouraged to engage in critical thinking. They're already encouraged to help their students do that. So what, what did this bill add, really? The main thing that we could tell is that it, the, or that, that might be different, is that if a teacher decided to bring in creationist material and teach it, if the school district said you have to stop doing that or we're gonna we're gonna have to fire you or we're gonna have to suspend you or discipline you in some other way the teacher might say well you can't do that because I'm just encouraging critical thinking with this lesson and the law says that you can't you can't punish me for that or a student could every time that the teacher mentions millions of years what happens if the student says well actually every time sticks a hand up and says actually the earth is less than 10,000 years old and the teacher says, I need, that's disruptive, you need to stop, could the student then say, well, I'm just encouraging critical thinking and you can't punish me for that. That's the danger. That's the fear with these bills. In Tennessee, the bill was filed by Senator Bo Watson, who didn't do it on his own behalf. He explained to the press that he did this as a favor to his predecessor, in, in office who had left the Senate and gone to become the head of the Tennessee affiliate of Focus on the Family, a religious right group. 
And, you know, because that guy was his predecessor, because he had political power through the, the, the religious right group, uh, and because they're part of that same club, essentially, of, of current and former state legislators, they had a special connection. It was possible there was a personal connection there that his predecessor could build on and say, could you file this bill on my behalf? And Watson, who didn't necessarily care one way or the other, would be willing to do that favor. Uh, when one of Watson's former professors from college contacted him and said, you know, a biology professor, you know, I've got some concerns about this bill. I think that it, it's misleading. I think it could be harmful. Can we talk about it? Watson was also much more willing to listen to him than he might have been to listen to any randomly chosen professor. So again, personal connections were, are really important. And if they can be developed before there's a crisis, if you're, when you're planning to, if you think you might be lobbying a legislator, if you think that something might come up in your state legislature, or you just want to be able to, to lean on the, the chair of the education committee, building that relationship before there's a crisis, before you're going to be asking for something, is a lot more effective than trying to build it while you're asking for a favor, while you're asking them to do a thing. And the great thing about state legislatures is a given representative represents a lot fewer people than a member of Congress, you know, federal officials who might have hundreds of thousands of people in their district. There might be tens of thousands of people in a state legislative district. So you probably, this is your neighbor, is representing you in, in the state legislature. You probably have either a direct connection, you know them, you run into them at the supermarket, or you know somebody who knows them. The, the chain of connections is going to be a lot tighter for state legislatures than for a lot of other offices. So you probably have those personal connections and can build on them um, beforehand, ideally, but certainly in the moment. What we found in Tennessee was there wasn't an existing organization of, you know, a Citizens for Science group the way that exists in Oklahoma, Kansas, New Mexico, Florida, and a bunch of other states where there are people, you know, when a bill is filed, there immediately are people who know how to reach out to the relevant people in the committee. They know what the rules are in the state legislature, what committee has to do what, how a bill moves back and forth, what's the timing, what are the pressure points, who might be sympathetic, who might be unsympathetic, how, what's the best way to go about it. There wasn't, you know, the, the Tennessee ACLU was incredibly helpful, they're incredibly effective, and often state ACLUs are, are wonderful allies, but they've also got a lot of other things going on. So having someone who's dedicated to this issue can be really valuable. We were trying to build that on the spot, which is really hard to, to organize as you're in the middle of the fight. It's much better to do it beforehand, which is why we're doing these webinars. In this case, the bill, once, once it started moving, the first year Watson agreed to, to table it on the advice of his former professor. The next year, out of nowhere, he brought the bill back and it raced through committee, it raced to the floor, it was passed before there was time really to organize in any sort of effective way. At which point it went to the governor. Bill Haslam. And at that point, again, the, the, the critical thing about knowing the rules of the particular legislature at hand, the state constitution allows the legislature to override the governor's veto on a simple majority vote. The same vote that passes the bill overrides the veto. So that's Tennessee. Other states do it differently. Knowing what those rules are, knowing what those differences are, is, is absolutely crucial to being an effective lobbyist. So when we were trying to get an angle on, on what Haslam could do about this bill once it was sent to him, asking him to veto it was sort of the only option, but we also knew that if he just vetoed it, the legislature would pass it again and he would be stuck. So he had no incentive to veto it. He had no, there's no, no political angle there. So we needed to find a way to connect to him that would make it worth his while to reject the bill and that would that might actually gum the bill up if it was sent back on, with a veto. 
And that meant not just coming at it from, from what motivated us to be concerned about it, the First Amendment concerns, the, the concern about the integrity of science. That's not what gets Bill Haslam up in the morning. That's not what a politician in a state like Tennessee is most concerned about. Because those are issues that are going to do a lot more to energize the, the radical right, the, the creationist voters, than the much smaller fraction of people who are really excited about science and who get out and vote. So we needed to find something that would work for him politically, give him an excuse, the excuse that we know that he would want to veto this bill or to stop it. And at first, he didn't seem really inclined. He, a reporter asked him about it, and he said, you know what, I'm not even going to answer, tell you what I'm going to do about it, because the only questions I've gotten about it are coming from reporters. But by saying that, that gave us an angle on how to approach it. So we sent out a, a mass email to people in Tennessee, our, our members and and allied groups through groups like Climate Parents, Americans United, ACLU, other groups. And the, the message was that Haslam wants to hear from you. He's saying that he's only hearing about it from reporters. Well, that must mean he wants to hear from voters. So here are some questions to ask. If he's not hearing these already, here's what he should be hearing. Why does this bill change the rules in science classes? Why does it single out science? Why does it single out evolution? What is this bill supposed to solve? Here are our problems with it. Here are our concerns. We think that it should be vetoed and that until these questions are answered, he shouldn't allow it to become law. So that gives him an excuse for why he should veto it, and it doesn't require him to take any stance at all on the merits of evolution or climate change or creationism or whatever. It takes it out of that realm that is politically dangerous for him and makes it hopefully politically comfortable emphasizing that there are too many unanswered questions. The bill's language is confusing, and he should oppose the bill until these and other important questions were resolved. There was also a, a petition drive, and through Climate Parents, they presented a petition with thousands of signatures to the governor and the legislature. And in the end, he didn't veto it. But he did decline to sign it, and the reasons that he gave for doing that came right out of the talking points that we were using. He said, good legislation should bring clarity and not confusion. My concern is that this bill has not met that objective. For that reason, I will not sign the bill, but will allow it to become law without my signature. It's not the best outcome, but it's probably the best that we could have expected. He knew that the votes it passed overwhelmingly through both houses. There was no way that, he was gonna, that a veto would be sustained. So why should he put him, make himself look politically weak by vetoing something and having immediately his veto be overridden. But by doing this, he s disassociates himself from it. We can take that same language to teachers and say, look, this bill is confusing. Here's what it really means. And here's what you should not think that it means. And we can go to court with it. We can tell the court, look, this bill may be unconstitutionally vague. You should strike it down. Or you should, because everyone involved, even the governor, thinks it's confusing, Here's how the courts should interpret it. They should interpret it narrowly like this. This is how he says it should be done. So we're thinking ahead, which is a key part of, of lobbying. Recognizing that you may lose, are there questions that you should be asking? Are there amendments that you should be proposing that you know will get voted down, but that will force people onto the record? Are there ways that you can force people to reveal the religious motivations behind a bill to talk about creationism, to talk about their, to, that, that they want Genesis taught in, in science classrooms? Are there ways to bring out those motivations so that in the event of a court case, in the event that the bill becomes law and you have to file a suit, that's part of the record? So again, you know, be thinking strategically, be thinking several steps ahead. Uh, know the particulars of your legislature. The details matter. And this is something that Oklahomans for Education, Excellence in Science Education and Vic Hutchinson have been incredibly effective at. And build relationships. It's not just about this fight. Is there a way that you can establish a relationship before there's a conflict that opens up the door to, to successful collaboration later on so that you're not coming in as a stranger saying, I need you to vote against this bill but you're saying, hey, remember how we worked together on this other issue before? I wanted to talk to you about this new bill that's just been filed. 
that second approach is a lot more likely to get you know state legislatures have a million things on their desks every day is there a way that you can get out of the big pile of stuff and have them pay attention to you it's through those personal connections with this as with everything and i'm reusing these slides from the first webinar that we did always start out quietly start out nicely don't open by threatening lawsuits. Don't open by accusing people of things or calling people names. Don't necessarily reveal what angle of attack you might use in the event that you need to pick a fight like that. Don't make people pick sides if you don't know that they're going to pick yours. Give them a reason not to take sides just yet so that they can, so that when you need to put pressure on them, you've given them all the reasons that they should need to pick your side, and you haven't forced them to do that prematurely. You can always escalate, but it's hard to ramp down. Thank you for your attention, and I hope that was helpful. We've got a lot more resources on our website and a lot of ways to reach us. Thank you so much.